everyone, welcome to MBM Online. So, so good that you can join us today. My name is Pri, I'm one of the pastors here at MBM. Uh, if it's your first time here, I just wanna say a big warm welcome from myself as well as the whole MBM family. Uh, we hope that you find this sermon helpful. We hope that you find MBM Online helpful. Uh, and if there's anything that you'd like to know more about MBM, more about what Christianity is about, more about who Jesus is and what he means for you, we'd love for you to get in contact with us. You can do that by heading to our website, go to the what's on bit and someone will get in contact with you. Uh, well, we have Al Stewart. Uh, he's been here plenty of times before for our MBM family, so you know who he is. He's going to be finishing off our series in Matthew. And so uh, why don't you join me as we pray to our great God, as we ask him to help us to listen to his word and apply that to our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and how it directs us in life, that you have revealed yourself to us through your word. Uh, and Lord, we pray that as we listen to your sermon today, to the sermon today, that you would help us to sit under your word, help us to think through uh, what does this mean for our lives? How are we living in submission to uh, the Lord Jesus. Uh, and Lord, as we especially approach Easter, thinking about many of us, uh, many people who don't know who Jesus is, we pray, Lord, that you would bring many people along to our Easter services. Please even now put those names that you have already chosen to bring to those services on our hearts now, our family, our friends, who you want us to invite. Uh, and we pray that you would work in their hearts to come along to our service, to our Easter services this Sunday. Lord, we're also mindful that the COVID cases have gone up again. Many people who are in lockdown, many people who uh, aren't feeling well. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would please uh, heal them. We pray that they would recover well and get to uh, back to life in some sense of normality. Uh, we thank you that through all of this, Lord, you are sovereign, you are in control. And we've seen that as you are the King, which you've revealed to us through the book of Matthew. And so please prepare us to listen to that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, it's great to be with you this morning. <clears throat> We're looking at a, actually a really hard part of the Bible this morning. Not that it's hard to understand. Kind of ironically, it's so easy to understand. That's, that's kind of the problem, if I could say that. Let's get started. A few years ago, I, actually quite a few now, I, I enrolled in a speed reading course. I'm a real plotter when it comes to reading, so I thought I'll go see if I can learn to read faster. Didn't really work. Um, it, it was it was one night a week for a number of weeks, and I remember one night there was a when the group broke up. There was a young bloke there. He actually, he's American. I could tell from his accent, and he needed a lift some to the station. And the station's five minutes away. I said, "Jump in. I'll, I'll give you a lift." So he gets in, and and uh, and then says to me, "Well, what do you do for a living?" I thought, we've got five minutes, no time for subtlety. I said, I work for a church. What do you think about God and spiritual things? And uh, uh, he was really good. He was relaxed. He went, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, he said, oh, well, I guess I, guess I live by the Sermon on the Mount. And then there was a pause, and he said, but I've never read it. <laughs> Seriously. And I thought, mate, speed reading course? Well, you know, like, it only takes 10 minutes for me to read it out loud. Now, here's, here's what I thought as I thought about that. If you're really comfortable and relaxed about the Sermon on the Mount, there's a good chance you've never read it. Right? Matthew chapter 5 through to 7, uh, Jesus, in, who's loving and compassionate and cares for us, but he says some really hard things. And today as we look uh, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, as uh, MBM, you, you've been, if you're regular here, you've been working your way through Matthew's Gospel and you've just finished chapters 5 to 7. Uh, Jesus says something that his conclusion really cuts completely across the politically correct way to think about religion today. Because the correct way in our society, or the politically correct way, um, is, is really to think in terms of pluralism. Now, what is that? We'll get a definition up here for a second. Uh, and here it is. Okay, here's what pluralism is. Philosophically, religious pluralism is the theory that the great religions constitute varying conceptions of and responses to the one ultimate mysterious divine reality. Meaning basically all the major religions are the same, 
And they're all just kind of part of the one broad path up the mountain to God. And, you know, that's, that's comfortable and that's polite and we can all get on and it's nice and it's like a warm bath. You can kind of slide in and be comfortable. Except there's one person you can't add to that list and that's Jesus. And we'll see that Jesus says the road to God, the true road to God is narrow. The gate is narrow. Um, and so the implication of that is that other beliefs that don't follow him and his teachings are wrong. Now, I don't know if you feel the weight of that, if you're a follower of Jesus, or I guess if you're a follower of Jesus, or if you're not, I'd like you to feel the weight of that. Because, like, here's a list of people, of, of beliefs that Jesus says are wrong. Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, Baha'i, Shintoism, Confucianism, Zoroastrianism, Animism, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Moonies, Christian scientists, the Scientologists, the New Ages, Marxists, Atheists, Agnostics, Skeptics, Unitarians, and Pluralists. I, I almost left that list out because I figure I'm going to almost offend everybody. I'll offend some people because I put them in the list and then others will be offended because I missed them out of the list. So I I don't mean to offend, I'm just saying this, this is what Jesus says. Oh, and by the way, if you've read the Sermon on the Mount, you'll know in chapter 5, Jesus says, everyone should be treated with love. Friend or foe, whatever people believe, disagree, etc., love them, treat them with respect. But he says, he's the only way. Now, in the, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it, <laughs> it couldn't be clearer Actually, today's talk isn't that long because it really is not, it, not complicated, what Jesus says. It's got a hard edge, but it's not complicated. Anyway, Jesus says, make choices. It's not all the same. You've got to choose, and choices have consequences. And so he says, we'll work our way through. He says, choose your gate, choose your profits, choose your actions, choose your foundations. Let's have a look. First of all, he says, choose your gate or, or choose your road. Uh, chapter 7, verse 13. It says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. See, Jesus says the road to destruction is broad. Uh, the road to life isn't broad and wide. Is it? And Jesus warns about a judgment day again and again. In fact, I think, I think that is the most common topic that he talks about. And he warns, out of love, but he warns that those who've spent their life ignoring him or walking away from him, that God will give them, if you like, reinforce that and send them from his presence into an empty, lonely, hopeless eternity. And Jesus' word for that is hell. And, you know, there's so many Christian teachers have stopped talking about that. Why? Because it's really confronting. I, look, I find it hard. It's like facing up to what Jesus teaches about eternity and the judgment day. It's like kind of staring at the sun. You can kind of, you can only do it for a fra like you, you, it, It's so emotionally confronting. And yet, Jesus believed this, believed it enough to go to the cross to pay the price of forgiveness. If any other way, you know, if all the different ways went to God, why, why was the cross necessary? Jesus pays the price of forgiveness and rises again to bring new life. And he says again and again, he's the only way. So in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, um, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Or the apostles, uh, the ones that Jesus sent out to preach. The apostle Peter says in the book of Acts, Acts is like the, the history of the early, the early church. So Peter stands up in Acts chapter 4 and says, Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, centerpiece of the building. Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now, I guess there's many questions come out of that. One of the questions would be, well, how many? If the gate's narrow and there's only a few, like, you know, there's 25 million people in Australia, how many will be saved? 
How many? How would Jesus answer that? Well, someone asked Jesus that question one day. Let me show you in Luke's gospel. Um, someone asked Jesus basically that question. Luke chapter 13, verse 23. It says, someone, someone asked him, here we go, yep. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? There's your question. How many? What percentage? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. You see Jesus answer, Oh, is there only going to be a few? He says, just make sure that you're there. Because there'll be a time when it's too late. So he says, choose your gate. And then uh, he moves on to warn us about who we should listen to. or or not listen to. Um, See chapter 7, verse 15, choose your prophets, those who claim to speak for God. He says, verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Uh, I think we've got a picture of a wolf in sheep's clothing here. There we go. um, I'm not sure quite how they did that, but that's, that's what it would look like. Hard, just hard to tell from a di- if you take your glasses off, just hard to tell. Now, look, there's all sorts of crazy new cults and things start, right? all, all sorts of crazy things. I remember one preacher saying in California, if you go to the beach, if you grow a beard, go to the beach and call yourself Moses, in half an hour you'll have 50 followers. Um, with all those new religions, I tell you the test to apply. When some guy comes along and starts a new religion, just have a look. Who gets the girls and who gets the money? Right, that's a very good, two very good tests to, uh, to ask. But I don't think that's the kind of uh, thing that Jesus is talking about because your really effective false prophet looks like a sheep, looks like one of Jesus' people. And so the really dangerous false teachers, false prophets have all the right credentials like degrees in theology and PhDs, etc., and all the denominational um, uh, accreditation, etc. And what the false prophet will bring is comfort and peace. Comfort and peace, well, that's what we all want. Uh, C.S. Lewis talks about uh, how um, as he, you know, like kind of as a teenager, he, he was kind of lulled into this, Uh, He says this, I was, in the famous words, altering I believe to one does feel, and oh, the relief of it. From the tyrannous noon of revelation, I passed into the cool evening twilight of higher thought, where there was nothing to be obeyed and nothing to be believed except what was either comforting or exciting. You can choose what you believe. So we've got bishops in Australia who don't believe the authority of the Bible, uh, don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, don't believe in a judgment day, don't believe, will not teach about hell. And so the, you know, the sexual morals of the Bible are just kind of thrown out so that we can fit in with our culture today. Um, How do you pick who are the right prophets, who are the right teachers? Well, Jesus tells us in chapter 7, verse 16. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Look at the results of what someone teaches, their own life and then the effect on those who listen. Just watch. I mean, if you've got eyes to see, uh, liberalism, and liberalism is the, the label that's given basically to when, when a church or its teachers sit over the Bible and then pick and choose what they'll believe by what's relevant today. Liberalism um, is just parasitic on the gospel and it actually ends up hollowing out a church so there's just nothing left. And churches become an empty shell of what they should be and our country's full of them. 
Or, or another one is the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel lies to people about what Jesus promises and then in the end so many of them get spat out at the end, disillusioned with Jesus because Jesus didn't keep promises that he never made. You see if you look for the results. Okay, so be careful what others teach, but then <laughs> Jesus even sharpens it up more and he says, be careful about ourselves and how we live. Because have a look at 21, choose your actions. This really is, it does have sharp edges. So uh, 721, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So not everyone who kind of talks the talk, but only one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Sorry, my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You notice Jesus says, many will say to me, he just assumes that he will be the judge on that day. In verse 22, the people who come to him and say, Lord, Lord, have done spectacular things. So they've prophesied and performed miracles, etc. I had a man ask me after the uh, nine o'clock church meeting, how, how could they perform miracles and not be with the Lord, not be with Jesus? The answer is this. The Bible warns us the miracle isn't the thing. The miracle is in whose power that has been done and what the conclusions are from it. In fact, Jesus warns that the evil one will produce signs and wonders. So they did these things. I think what Jesus is saying is you can do all of these spectacular things and they've even done them in the name of Jesus, but they've not actually, see verse 21, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You actually have to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Or um, say in Luke's gospel, Jesus says much the same thing. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he says to the would-be disciples, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Now, folks, you've got to get it right. You don't earn friendship with Jesus. We don't earn forgiveness. We don't earn eternal life, of course. It's the gift of God. And anyone who trusts Jesus is given that. But that trust, or the other way you could say trust or faith, exactly the same word in the New Testament, that trust has got to if it's genuine, it's got to show itself in how we live. To say, yeah, I trust Jesus, but I don't live the way he says, that, that's a nonsense. You obviously don't trust him. Now, it won't be perfect, and we're still going to mess it up and do the wrong thing, and uh, we're still all sinners, and certainly me. But it's, are you, are you for real about walking towards him? And, you, you know, you'll fall over, you'll get it wrong, and you get up, and you ask for forgiveness, and you keep walking towards him. That's what he's talking about. But there's a big difference between just saying it. He said, no, 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 you, you've got to do it. And the next one, so that's the difference between what you say and what you do. And then the, in the last one, he picks up the difference between what we hear and what we do. So you see that um, Ben's just done a really good job explaining about the, the building on the rock and on the sand. What Jesus is saying is there's a storm coming. Uh, and, I mean, very sadly, we saw... A storm and a flood. Very sadly, we saw with the you know the terrible things on the north coast. When the when the storm or the flood's coming, you've got to be ready in advance. When it arrives, it's it's too late to do anything. So you see what Jesus says about the storm, the judgment day that's coming. Uh, chapter seven, verse twenty-four. Choose your foundations. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and, blew and beat against that, that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. Verse 26, For everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Interesting, wasn't it? Uh, ben showed us the sand is really soft and there's no hard edges and it kind of fits around whatever you want to do, and etc. Uh, the rain came down. The streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. So do you notice actually they both hear but one puts things into practice and one doesn't. And, they, and it's not really obvious actually until the great 
test or the, the storm and the wind and everything comes. So what's Jesus saying? It, it's all right to hear, but it's putting it into practice that counts. Now have a look at how the, the Sermon on the Mount ends. Chapter 7, verse 28 says, when Jesus had finished these, uh, sorry, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Now, here's what's interesting. Um, at the beginning, in chapter 5, Jesus goes up on a mountain. He calls his disciples, those who would follow him, to him. He sits down because in, in those days um, the teacher would sit and everyone else stands. Um, but he's talking to his disciples by the time you get to the end, Matthew tells us that the crowds were at the back listening, kind of rubbing their chins, you know, thinking, hmm, that, you know, and they're trying to wear, who is this guy? He speaks with such authority. So there's some who've chosen to follow him, but there's others who are just, who are listening. And if that's you today, it's great that you're here. Well done. Terrific to hear and, and to hear Jesus. And can you feel the authority in his words as he speaks? And so you have to make choices about whether or not you'll follow him. And why does he bang the drum so hard? I think I'll put that slide, we'll put that slide up again, the choices. It, it couldn't be much clearer, right? Um, choose your gate. W will, you, will you go with the crowds and, the, and, and so on, or will you go with the few? Choose your prophets. Who will you listen to? Choose your actions. Will you put into practice what he says? And then choose your foundations. Will you do more than just hear? Will you put it into practice? Why does he keep pushing? It's a matter of life or death. Spiritual life or death. Where will we spend eternity? Uh, folks, we all, we've all got decisions to make, and I don't know where where you stand on this, but if you're not sure, come talk to me later. Uh -huh. uh, I'm a friendly person, really, I am, okay? Uh, or or um, Steve will tell you about the I'm new here, right? He's got the flag at, yep, at, uh, at morning tea. But come talk to someone and find out more how to take the next step to walk towards Jesus. And for the rest of us who, who are followers of Jesus, you feel the sharp edges in this. You feel the weight of it. And I've lived with it all week, thinking about it. Well, because there's a whole lot of people, well, a handful in particular, that I really love. And they're there not on the straight way. And I, I feel the, the weight of that. And you know, not just the people that we love, and no, but the overwhelming majority of Australians are on the broad path and not following Jesus. And what does that turn into? Well, I get the implications are huge. Let me just say one thing to MBM, because uh, I, really, I really care for you guys and watched MBM grow over years. It's been great. I, I talk in my job and over the years, I've talked to many, many churches and the leaders of many churches, pastors and, and elders, etc. And I'll ask them, do you, do you want to grow? Do you, do you want to be able to welcome people and, and see people come to know Jesus? Everyone says, yes, absolutely, we want to grow. And then I'll ask, are you prepared to change? Change the way you meet, what you do, where you, how you do it. And do you know what? So often the answer is no rather just kind of stay in the comfort zone and so it's such a big question are you prepared to change to love the people who haven't joined you yet I wonder if you'd pray with me Lord God we thank you for sending our Lord Jesus into the world we thank you for his love shown to us in words with sharp edges and hard choices, but his love shown in paying the price of forgiveness at the cross and offering new life through the resurrection. We ask please that you help us to see very clearly the choice of the narrow gate, 
the right teachers or prophets to listen to, that we might live trusting him and build our lives on Jesus the rock. And we ask this in his name. Amen.